Hey everybody, so today we are going to be joined by a special guest and that is Ellie Young, someone who is very well known in the Knowledge Graph community because she has been very involved in the last few years. And one thing that she has really put her passion behind is how to use graph and other means for climate change and sustainability. So that among other things are the topic for the day. So if you were interested in hearing my take with Ellie on this topic, make sure you stick around. Um, so if you don't know me, I'm the previous head of community at the Knowledge Graph Conference, um, organized the, the KGC Conference in 2021, and have now uh, started a, a company around building a climate change knowledge graph and a software to support people to sort of do climate action. Um, and one of the things that I've done over the last year is get connected to the National Science Foundation's Open Knowledge Network Design Innovation Sprint. And what this was about um, was sort of a an, an initiative from uh, the the White House to invest in sort of the technology infrastructure that we need for you know moving more further into AI, and um, of course you know knowledge graphs and knowledge networks are uh, a, an obvious choice for a connected data infrastructure. And so uh, what NSF did along with the Office of Science and Technology Policy was bring about 200 academics together from computer science and sort of, you know, converge us to discuss various dynamic aspects of designing an OKN um, infrastructure, like an infrastructure for the entire country versus like a single use case. Mm -hmm. um, and we also emerged some use cases to make it a little bit easier for people to understand what this is. So there were 18 use cases that came out of that supply chain, climate change, natural disaster, these kinds of things. I love the climate change use case. And the um, the basic idea of what, you know, an open knowledge network is, it's a, it's a collection of connected knowledge graphs. So you can imagine that there's some public data, there's private data, there's standards that connect across these uh, different representations, and there's a dynamic range of users that we're, we're really trying to address. And so what came out of these use cases was um, a real emphasis on the socio-technical design process, not only for creating the UIs and designing the competency questions and the content mm -hmm. that need to be served, but also for like engaging people to build community adoption and interest in the early stages mm -hmm. of the project, which is what, you know, so often doesn't happen when knowledge graphs aren't adopted. So there's a whole lot um, of thinking around sort of, you know, how this actually could get built in addition to you know, what the technical pieces are. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I love this, this understanding that, Hey, we got to come together on something. Right. Yeah. And, you know, um, a similar use case that I'm familiar with, I was, I was heavily involved in um, the IOT, right. On how do you connect different data sources and knowledge graphs on the internet of things, because if you need to connect in and, and really understand something from, you know, a digital twin or a 360 kind of view, you need to kind of understand all the different components to that. And I think this is a very similar use case. But but yeah, I mean, so that's, you know, what we're increasingly seeing is that there's there's complexity, right? And the complexity yeah. is both within our organizations and it's also, and especially between them. And so like what all of these use cases had in common, despite, you know, there are many different focus areas was that they wanted to bring together a lot of different stakeholders who don't speak the same language, don't need the same data, right? Mm -hmm. So some of these use cases are maybe medicine where we're trying to capture uh, data entry from healthcare workers and then bridge that over to, you know, doctors or administrators yeah. or researchers yeah. and, and on and on. And so, you know, there's almost like this data supply chain. Yeah, yeah. To start thinking and talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah, it's it's kind of a, a bridge, right? Like that's where that interoperability, things that you hear like the data mesh and the data fabrics and all of that. And and when you're talking about like bringing these things together, not everyone needs the same kind of data, right? But understanding what data is available to you supplies that innovation, right? Because now you're thinking, well, I didn't need that data, but that's kind of cool data. What can I do with it? And what kind of trends and analyses can I get from it um, that, that are going to help me? So what are some of the struggles that, that you've seen so far in this? I mean, there's got to be some pitfalls so far. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, I mean, so, of course, the, the struggle always is like getting agreement, right, and alignment. Um, now, so so far, the OKN effort has been a sprint. It's, it's a design sprint. So we have these use cases, but um, there has not yet been an RFP. So there are not yet actually live instances of, you know, going to, to make it happen. 
But we've been working with um, a group at NASA, the Center for Helio Analytics, mm -hmm. around some of these concepts, right? So it's not, you know, maybe quite an okay, and we call it a knowledge commons currently, but yeah. same idea, community yeah. maintained kind of knowledge graphs. Yeah. Um, and, you know, one of the, I mean, there's there's so many, I think like the the easiest thing to say that's kind of like a initial challenge is that there's so much complexity and there's so much dynamicity mm -hmm. in what stakeholders want. And we really, I don't know if we've, you know, um, collated that really well. So yeah. it's kind of a new discovery process. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, just talking to stakeholders and learning like the right questions to ask and also the right way to frame things. Um, so that, you know, trust is easy to develop yeah. and, and a lot of uncertainty, like doesn't get, you know, sort of brought in. So we had, for example, like a, a vote camp at NASA recently. And, you know, some of the folks there were just not that familiar with ontology work. Mm -hmm. And they were like, well, why do we need this? Because we're mm -hmm. scientists and we don't agree on what mm -hmm. this word means. And like, we're never going to agree on that. So we really should be encoding it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're just like, yeah, just, just forget about it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's like, well, you know, I mean, and that's a really valid use case, right? So when you think about like an OKN, how, how would we approach each of these kinds of, you know, conditions and some of them are going to be really specific, but some of them are going to be patterns yeah. and you know, they, they, we don't agree on terms is, is a pretty common pattern. Yeah. Um, so how do you, you know, how do you deal with that in a strategic yeah. way? Right. This is, this is the the theme. I think that even aside from what you're working on or what others are working on in these interoperable kind of spaces is how do we get over that cultural hump of turf wars? Because I kind of feel like sometimes it it's twofold, the turf war thing. It's, um, and this is from my own personal experience, at least. Uh, the first is, what's my data? I don't want you to touch my data, my data. Don't, don't yeah. touch my data, right? <laughs> like we're like hoarders, we're data hoarders. Um, and then the other side of it is my data is just so beautiful. And we took so much time to make this and it's perfect. And it's just, it's, it's, you don't, please don't mess with it. Right. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's a, I don't want you to touch it. And the other is why well, I, I don't really want you to touch it because you're not going to understand how special mm -hmm. it is. I, I think there's a, I mean, there's so much psychology to be yes. honest in this yes. and, and the answers are not hard or fast or, I mean, <laughs> they might be hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they are hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, so, I mean, we really kind of have to like explore, you know, the underpinnings in each case. And, and I do think that there, again, that, that, that there are patterns and that that would be really interesting to like write about. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, when it comes to like, for example, um, like let's say climate change, right? Mm -hmm. We, you know, we, we don't have, uh, as much of that sort of data possessiveness because mm -hmm. it's just not yet been sort of done <laughs> enough, right. Yeah. That we have yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but you do have so much like uncertainty and, and so you get kind of the same, there's, there's, you know, different ways of having, uh, difficulty harmonizing stakeholders. Yeah. So, so yeah. sometimes they don't want to connect because they're already really like mature and in place. And sometimes they don't want to connect because they've never connected before. Yeah. And they're actually like similar challenges, right? Like it's all about negotiation and communication and sort of like, you know, making the case for why it makes sense to come forward. So like, I heard a really good example, mm -hmm. uh, uh, earlier this week, actually from, um, someone who works in the autom automotive space for sharing data. And he said, mm -hmm. you know, we're able to, um, like predict road conditions and mm -hmm. I, I forget the specifics, but there's something that we can do, right? Like we know that the, mm -hmm. the road is going to be slippery if we can aggregate enough data from mm -hmm. multiple automotive suppliers, because it's just not enough with, with what we you know have in one company. Mm -hmm. And so there's this, you know, there's these clear benefits that come from merging data into yeah. like larger collective structures yeah. that no one can access on their own, right? Like this is, you know, sort of the public good. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think like the answers are in being able to articulate that really well. So people yeah. can understand it and see it versus like, why are you taking my data away from me? Yeah. It's like, well, actually, and we're not taking it away. We're just yeah. adding it here and yeah. putting some other stuff in the pot, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean that, that, that's that, you know, sharing of data, right is um it is a very visceral kind of thing a little bit right like it's it's um again going back to that IoT example that I was in I remember 
you know, we, we had to bring together all the major players and a lot of them were in competition. A lot of them were competing for the same customer base. Uh, and it was the strangest thing to see them go, what kind of data can, it's like, here's my cards. What card can I give you? You know? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's that common good kind of thing where you have to find the use case that gives them the incentive to share some of it. And mm -hmm. of course, they're not going to give away the store. And I don't think anyone is expecting people to do that. But it's what what can we share? What can we I, I always I always laugh because, um, you know, having some of the terminology like taxonomy stuff in my background, I always laugh when people think that they own a taxonomy. It's mm -hmm. just words. I don't own the word cat. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like no one owns that word. Like certain so, certain words are trademarked, of course. But like I don't own the word cat or dog, but it's the composition of those things. It's what you do with that data. It's how you define that data. That's what's proprietary. And I think it's it's a shift and it's been shifting. Um, mm -hmm. where people are starting to realize that wow, you know, there's just a ton of data out there. I don't necessarily need to worry so much about the data I own. Again, that aside from privacy and all of those things, those are very important to keep keep track of. But it's it's more about what do you do with the data, making sure that you're doing things that are ethical, making sure that you are sharing data for good purposes, like like you're talking about, um, making sure that you understand who's allowed to touch that data and who is sharing it and who is allowed to access it and how it's being used. All of those things, um, I think, are they're, they're recognized, but not well understood. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, in many ways, this is sort of like the frontier, at least it's the frontier that I see because we haven't had the ability maybe to, to, you know, make collective data products for so yeah. long that we mm -hmm. have figured out what that, what the yeah. best practices look like. So we're really, you know, kind of in the early days of this. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, there's just a sort of a, a, a challenge that comes from the lack of general data literacy, right? Like, yes, mm -hmm. I because I use this and I derive value from it, then it must be, you know, like a trade secret in anyone's hands. Yeah, it's like, well, you know, maybe, but context is a big piece of this yeah. and not just the context of the data, but also the context of the user and what yeah. they you know are able to do. Right. So, like, I mean, even thinking about like from a more, you know, just straight practical assessment yeah. if you have you know 17 competitors in a room and they're all afraid of sharing their cards like even if you did give away the store right yeah what would have to happen is that person or those people would have to actually recognize it obtain uh -huh. it go back to their systems or massive you know corporation mm -hmm. plug plug that data into the right <laughs> system right like it would yeah. be it would take like they'd have to go get funding to yeah. Yeah. steal your yeah. information. <laughs> Ellie, I'm so glad you said that because as soon as you said it, I'm like, huh, that's true. I never thought of it that way. But like, think of any data migration project you've ever been in, and that's your own data trying to figure it out. Try to think about somebody else's data. Um, that's that's a little bit more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's describing things that you're not even as familiar with. Like, I think one of the things that I've realized is like when we're when we're super familiar with something, like it seems so obvious to us. Yeah, and I, I've had this conversation. I mean, really, like it's kind of separate to the OKN idea, but like just sort of sharing about you know early early ideas about how we were going to address climate and like and yeah. sometimes meet competitors, and I'd be like, oh my god, you know, if I tell you anything, you're going to see yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. And it's like, it's not that way because they don't have our perspective, right? Yeah. And they don't have like all of the um, contextual knowledge yeah. that is yeah. required to interpret and like create. Mm -hmm. And so I think like part of the whole data literacy challenge is, I mean, data, of course, is, you know, it's a black box, right? It comes from the screen <laughs> if you're yeah. not a technical person. Um, but also, I don't think we've really like, as you know, just sort of like generally as people really become conscious of our knowledge processes and our yeah. information and our thinking processes, right? Yeah. Like we're just in it and yeah. we're not so much like, oh, you know, what information am I looking at? Yeah. What am I bringing to this information to yeah. interpret it? What can I, you know, can I trust the source, right? Like this yeah. whole like range of ideas and concepts and challenges around data interpretation are just, we just, we just don't talk about them. Yeah. This is where, again, like we, we need to expand our vocabulary around data because yeah. When we think about, I mean, so when you say data, I mean, there's, you know, sort mm -hmm. of like, I imagine a bunch of like, you know, like 
strings. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But but if we think about what that is in terms of context of you know mm-hmm. what it's representing, data it's always a symbol of something real, right? Yes. There's there's the facts that don't change. Celine Dion was born, and that's you know <laughs> that's not going to change anytime soon, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there's also the operational data. And that's what actually really matters because that's what we have to make decisions around. And as you're saying, like are dependent on. Um, and I and I almost I mean, I'm starting to think that what is needed. I mean, there's a couple of like challenges here because one is that the operational field is so dynamic. Yeah. And this relates back to the ethical question, too. Like yeah. you have to know so many things that yeah. you actually can't like no one person yeah. can be a technical like engineer and also know about environmental and, and like all those other mm-hmm. things. Right. So how do we create the, the framework knowledge? almost? Yeah. yeah, exactly. The the sort of collective like which is the whole question, you know, the OKN and like just more broadly that I'm interested in is like, how do we, you know, think a little bit at the higher yeah. scale so that yeah. we can all tap into that. But then also like thinking about operational data. I mean, this is a big part of climate, right? In fact, this is actually um, significant appro- uh, about our approach. So, you know, there's tons and tons and tons and tons of environmental data. Yeah. And, you know, probably like many, many scientists and data scientists yes. could spend the rest of their lives like trying to just wrangle that. And, you know, yeah. meanwhile, climate is changing, right? So, yeah. you know, what I'm really focusing on is how we take I mean, how we develop a management framework mm-hmm. to say, there's a problem here and it needs to be addressed and it costs us much money right? yeah. <laughs> like, yep. to do that. yep. because that's what is actually, <laughs> that makes a difference. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And that does not come from the climate data or like you yeah. have to sort of, you know, interpret and, and, and synthesize it and simplify it. So I think there's like this whole field of like data strategic management right yeah. so beyond the technical like how do you actually store these things and how do you even organize them into knowledge graphs there's like actually the like who is the mckinsey of like understanding yeah. what is going on and how you should be making decisions like that's a really i think just like people haven't recognized because there's there's yeah. such a gap between the yeah. um the back end and the front end right like oh yes so so from the work that you're doing do you think there's any you maybe you have an opportunity for like some standards to to like some some learnings at least to go into standards. Yeah, I mean, I I I have kind of crazy thoughts. I think maybe about standards because I'm you know I'm an I'm an entrepreneur, so <laughs> I don't need to worry so much about all of the people that have to come together to agree. But what I think, and this is you know totally my own perspective, is that you know if we think about the OKN, right? The the sort of the goal of it is to create a secondary type of internet structure. It's it's mm-hmm. an infrastructure. It's not just a system. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you know we kind of can think back to the early days of the web. And and at this point, everyone who knows about you know the story of the semantic web and Tim Berners Lee will recognize you know the web was was released right. It was just a simple sort of package for yeah. moving files around, and it was certainly not designed in anticipation of where it would become, yeah. what it would become. Yeah. And so now it's almost like, you know, web 2.0, 3.0, I mean, whatever oh, yeah. the like number is, it's yeah. it's the chance to actually connect the metadata layer with yeah. it. Yeah. And so what I imagine is a new sort of basic web framework that has some inbuilt standards, right? So there's like actually atomic pieces that you mm-hmm. can sort of, you know, pull in yeah. to label yeah. some ideas. And so, you know, so we, we had a conversation about this a couple of weeks ago with the, the data team that we're starting to, to convene. And, um, you know, so so like some ideas around like really basic standards, right? Like measurements mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. prepositional phrases, right? Yeah. The stuff that kind of like holds things together, yeah. right? Yeah. We're limited. We're not going to tell you what words, you know, you have to yeah. use. I mean, yeah. I, I almost think that even that focus, right? Like to converge the words. Mm-hmm is so it's it's derived from the needs of a computer system which is yeah. sort of like you know you need you, this needs to be static yeah. versus like anything that makes sense about language right <laughs> like, yeah right it's like not like yeah. language is designed to be infinite yeah. you know you're you're like i don't know if the, the principle is the right way to approach yeah. but so i mean you know maybe i i i imagine that and this is sort of like the kind of work that you know you would want to do for an okn is like let's find the uh the desk study to find all those standards yeah. and then compare them and then yep. see you know which ones are maybe too much and which ones are not and then yeah. start with that as a framework right yeah. and say you know this is this is a living space it's designed yeah. to be changed but yeah. also like we do need some kind of basic things to, to yeah 
better. Well, it, it's funny that you say that too, because I used, so I used to work for a standards development organization, okay. <laughs> right? So I, I kind of understand how all that works. There was like this very fuzzy line between standard and recommended practice. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking to myself, aren't all standards recommended practice? Like there's very few people that follow a standard to the T. The only time that actually happens, and it does actually happen more often with like manufacturing and that sort of thing, where you have to build something to spec, right? There's Mm -hmm. a specific specification where lots of brilliant engineers have come together and said, this is the best way to make sure planes don't fall out of the sky with lithium ion batteries. (laughs) Probably an important thing to follow. Um, but the reason people follow it to the T is usually because it, because it becomes a regulation mm-hmm. and it's a law that you have to follow it, not necessarily because the standard said so, right? Right, right, right. And, right. and that's why, you know, when I start to talk about standards um, with engineers specifically, I've noticed they're like, oh, standards, uh, but we got, we have, we have so many exceptions and I'm like, Yeah. <laughs> Like, that's not what a standard is about. Um, so, you know, hearing that, that you're already thinking about it from that perspective um, with the work that you're doing, where it's it's like those little, you know, almost like micro architectures to say like, okay, here's this one thing that if you're going to be doing this, here's here's some best practices that we have, we've identified. You, if you have better understanding, let us know. <laughs> I mean, I... I- I almost think, you know, this is a question of language, right? Like standard makes you feel like it's some kind of top down official yeah. thing yep. and 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 that it's a one size fit all, right? Like yeah. yeah. But really what we are looking for is agreements. Yeah. It's about the consensus because the reason the contracts. We, yes, exactly. Yep. We, we can only connect to each other if we agree to use the same language. <laughs> yes. 